When compared to some things on Earth, we are small. But when compared to the observable universe, we are like a fraction of a fraction of a speck of sand in the ocean. Above us, an endless void of mystery and possibilities. Infinite potential for horrors beyond our imagination. But also, comedy. Hey. Hi. Can we have Philip open the store? Lethal Company is a cooperative horror game made by the developer known as Zekers, who originally made games in Roblox years ago. My first exposure to Zekers was watching people like Astral Spiff play It Steals. And until playing Lethal Company, I didn't know Zekers had made any other games until looking at their Steam dev page. Unless you've been living under a rock, or you're not online much, which is good and healthy, you've probably heard of Lethal Company. It's a fantastic game that has earned every single bit of the popularity it's gained. It has excellent proximity voice chat, it's simple and fun to look at, and it's a well-designed game overall. But we'll get to all of that in time. This video is primarily covering the lore of Lethal Company, but I've also sprinkled in some skits, some information that you might not know, and my own takes on the Lethal Company world at large. Most of this video was originally released on November 29th of last year. I wanted to re-release it and redo it because of the new content that had been added to the game, but also to change things around and add even more. Towards the end of the video this time, I'm actually going to fully summarize the lore and say what I think about it and where it's going, and what it means for us as players. But I'm also going to discuss how this game works so well as a comedy horror game, which I was originally going to do as its own video. We've got more lore, we've got the weather, we've got comedy and horror. Everything you could want in life, baby. And remember, if you enjoy this video, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. It helps a lot and tells me what I should focus on and what I shouldn't. Chapters for this video will be in the description so you can jump around between sections as you like. The format is lore, then usually a skit and probably some type of informational bit, all based around the world and lore of Lethal Company. So. Let's pull on our jumpsuits and go scrapping in the dark and comedic world of Lethal Company. Welcome to the company. We're so glad you've decided to join our team. We offer a competitive and fast-paced work environment, but don't you worry because we play just as hard as we work. Today is your first day, and we're so excited to see your career growth. You've been supplied with all you need for your future job success. An autopilot ship, a bed, a manual, and the terminal to access travel, the company store, and anything else you might need on your travels. They're lying to you. Your quota is listed above the employee monitoring station. Do your best to meet it, or else, <laughs> and remember, happy scrapping. You're in deep. Access file, Sigurd. You wake up on a small ship wearing an orange jumpsuit. It doesn't fit well. You don't know how you got there, and the helmet that you're wearing is oddly shaped. What's up with these earmuffs? A strange but cheery robotic voice introduces you to your first day. Welcome to your first day on the job. This is your very own autopilot ship. It tells you to read the manual, and also plays a fantastic we little bot. You will be a great asset to the company. Great, great asset to the company. Asset. Great, great, great asset to the company. Asset. You read the manual. Okay, you skim the manual. You just got this job. You work for the company, a shady organization based out of the Thistle Nebula. Your job is to collect scrap and salvage to sell to the company, or give, or feed. Why? Well, we don't really know. Yet. On our ship, we find a note. It says we're in deep. The file name is Sigurd. If we type it into the console, it pulls up a series of logs from a previous crew. As we explore and do our jobs, We'll slowly find a series of tape decks which add entries to the page. The writer's name is Sigurd, and he's accompanied by his brother Desmond, 
a woman named Jess, and a very stinky man named Richard. So, we continue to explore, we sell scrap, and we find logs. We do our best to avoid our inevitable death at the hands of the entities. Oh, I'm fucked. Hello. We wonder why we're here, and what all of these terrors mean, and we just hope that we can survive. Before we continue, know that some of this content may not be in-game yet. I believe it was found by looking at the game's files by a user known as YKS on the Steam forums. You begin to read the logs. The most interesting thing on these early logs are the dates. The first log is titled just that, and is dated August 22nd, 1968? Sigurd is writing the log because Desmond asked him to, as a historical record. Sigurd even seems to know that people constantly die on the job. He says he's writing this in a professional manner, but it reads more like a teenager's Tumblr blog than a professional work diary. He signs off with their names. In the next log, titled Smells Here, and dated August 24th, we learn they've begun scavenging. We also learn that Sigurd doesn't really like Richard, to the point of threatening to push him into a lake, which we know would probably be murder in this game because our characters can't seem to swim in these awful suits. Sigurd really likes to do camera duty and questions what the company is using all of the scrap they're collecting for. The team slowly gets into the swing of things, or so Sigurd says. They routinely keep someone on camera duty. Sigurd becomes scared after hearing noises from behind the company wall. Not only that, but he pointed his flashlight into the opening slide that takes items and it wouldn't even pierce the darkness within. I, we need to probably go- oh! We apologize for interrupting your feature presentation, but we'd like to walk you through some of the amenities and more that you can find on your ship and in the company store. Four bunk beds can be found in the corner, with padded mattresses for optimum space and comforting sleep. An employee monitoring station is also included in your autopilot ship, so someone can keep watch for on-the-job accidents. Isn't that swell? A cabinet, not only to store your on-the-job tools, but also the salvage and scrap that you find along the way. Did you know that there are optional amenities for your autopilot ship in the company store? These cozy lights are only 140 credits and really change the mood in the cabin. <laughs> ah, relaxing. The CRTV set is available for insert here credits and has a variety of shows for your viewing pleasure. Our personal favorite is Greasy Cat. What a cute little greasy guy. Oh, I hope he gets a season yeah. two. This jack-o'-lantern is sure to get you in the fall spirit, and for the low, low price of only 50 credits. Give him a whack and hear him laugh. <laughs> Indeed. Are you getting tired of shitting in the woods? Or maybe showering in a lake? Through the company store, you can buy an optional toilet and shower for your capsule ship. Isn't that wonderful? But that's just what we can teleport onto your capsule ship. You can also order shovels, flashlights, zap guns, and more to be delivered by our state-of-the-art delivery ship. Hear the fantastic tunage and know that your package has arrived. But be careful. If you miss a delivery, there are no refunds. Well, would you look at that? New items are in stock in the company store. First up, we have the Pajama Man. This cute little sad guy is just the type of companion that you want on your ship. Not only does he squeak, but he brings an aura of cute depression that really matches how you feel. And this goldfish is another companion that you can have on your ship. And it's a goldfish. Isn't that great? You can also get a welcome mat, so every time you come back, you feel a little more at home on the ship, even if you're being chased by a bloodthirsty monster. <laughs> <laughs> and let's not forget the spray paint cans. 
You can spray your friends, you can spray buildings, you can even spray monsters, but we wouldn't recommend doing that. And now, back to our feature present- Signal received. Are you hearing this? Is someone out there? They say the moons are desolate, but they aren't. There are aliens, yes, but there are other things too. Things we can't explain. Monsters, ghosts, abominations beyond my comprehension. I don't remember how I got here. I want to go home. Not even the ship is completely safe. Signal terminated. Need to probably go. Oh! We need to probably go. Oh! In the next diary entry, dated only August, entitled Golden Planet, Sigurd heard screams over the walkie on the company planet. In the screams, a voice speaks to him of a golden planet, some kind of legend in the Thistle Nebula, that truly exists. It wasn't destroyed, as the stories and legends say. He says the planet was swallowed by the beast, and that the golden planet is now in the beast's belly, being digested. When asked what the beast is, the voice says that it doesn't know. The voice says once the beast ate the planet, they, and I am assuming meaning the people from the planet, and probably the voice itself, forgot everything. Once Sigurd tells the voice he's inside the company building, the voice freaks out. He begins to say nonsense, but Sigurd makes out him saying, spitting out the rhymes before turning the walkie off from panic. Jess later insists that the planet is just a story. She thinks of quitting, but only if Sigurd does. So they stay. He's no quitter. The next entry is titled Shady and dated August 31st, 1968. Sigurd has camera duty again on a moon that's raining. While doing so, he thinks about how shady the job is, how the contract only lasts a season getting an assessment from a strange voice over the phone. The ship is autopiloted. Sigurd thinks that the voice on the phone was fake. He speaks of terrible dreams and wanting to go home, but doesn't want to shame himself to his father. The next entry is called Sound Behind the Wall and is dated September 4th. They decide to go to the company store because the rate is 120%, which, fuck, that's fucking crazy luck and I've never seen that in the game yet. Sigurd complains and then says something absolutely terrifying. He describes a sound he heard from behind the wall as crying red faces all churned up and swept away by concrete, like the pestle and bowl his mom crushed her seeds and spices up in. That is absolutely horrific imagery and just, it sounds like it must have been the most legitimately terrifying sound he's ever heard to conjure up that mental imagery. He says he can still hear it in his head, even after initially hearing it. The next log is titled Goodbye, and is dated September 7th. Rich is dead. With one more room to check, Sigurd and Rich find a locked door. And when Sigurd isn't looking, a flower man, also known as a Bracken, breaks Rich's oh. neck and drags his body away into the facility. Sigurd is angry. He says the job isn't worth it, and calls Jess and Desmond cowards and idiots because they didn't want to retrieve Rich's body. They leave with a box of stamps, a bundle of cords, and a pair of scissors. Sigurd questions what the company even wants this random assortment of junk for. Signal received. They say the moons are desolate, but they aren't, and we all know it. From the local alien life to other things that are far from lifeless. The quiet is just there to disarm you, fair listener. Hearing the friendly moan of an air horn just there to deceive you. Because there are things hiding in the hallways of these facilities and you best keep your head on a swivel. The Bracken which killed Stinky Rich looks like, well, a Christmas tree. 
but most often all you see are its piercing white eyes. They stalk you, often trying to sneak up on crewmates. If they catch you unaware, crack, you are dead. And they drag you away to do God knows what with your body. Collect you? Remember, dear listener, stare at them, but not for too long. They will go away, but don't let your guard down, or else. They're considered dangerous. Threat level, homicidal greenery. The manticoils. They may look like dinosaurs, but they're basically crusty birds. Harmless, more scared of you than you should be of them. Threat level, cute. These things are monstrous. Coil heads. They don't move if you're looking at them, mostly. It's almost like they're designed to intimidate you, because even if they've stopped moving, their bobble head bounces around loudly to let you know how fast they were until you caught sight of them. And if they do catch you, they replace your head with a coil, almost as if they're trying to make you just like them. Apparently they give off a lot of radiation, and it's theorized they might have been biological weapons. They seem too logical. Threat level, literal killing machine. Roaming locusts are basically like bigger gnats. If you've ever walked into a cloud of gnats, you know what it's like. They'll buzz and fly near your ear, but they're basically harmless. Threat level annoying at worst. The eyeless dogs. They're called dogs, but they're basically incredibly aggressive Venus flytraps made of meat. As their name assumes, they cannot see, but they can hear. No, they do not have ears that you can see. So how they hear, who knows, but they will kill you. They're fast. You can dodge them as they are clumsy, but do not let that embolden you too much. They might just trip you right into their mouth. Threat level, I have no eyes and I must kill. Signal terminated. Remember to always report on the job incidents. Safety is incredibly important to the company. Dead coworkers will be replaced promptly. No, we cannot tell you whether the replacement is a new employee or a clone of the previous employee. You must figure that out yourself. Next of kin will be informed of your demise than any other circumstances. Neck broken, legs broken, left behind, electrocuted by bees, eaten alive, melted by slime, bitten to death, head removal, drowning, drowning in quicksand, killed by jeb, etc. Have a pleasant day, and remember, do your best to stay alive. You can't make money if you're dead. The next log is called Screams. It's dated September 13th, 1968. Sigurd called in Rich's death. Jess and Desmond were too scared to. The same fake voice picks up and apparently responded to Sigurd, saying it would contact the family as well as find a replacement. Sigurd continues to hear screams through the walkie near the wall, and apparently so do the others now. Jess and Desmond want to quit, but Sigurd does not. Idea is the next log, dated September 19th. Sigurd says that it feels like the other two have woken up, probably meaning they realize the real danger and mystery of the situation they're in. They no longer take risks, and while they don't get as much scrap, Sigurd feels far safer. He says he's sleeping better, but he can seemingly still smell rich, which might just be psychosomatic. I think he's scarred. The entry is capped off with Desmond hatching a plan. After Sigurd speaks about the company's fake phone voice again, Desmond believes that he might be able to track where the calls are coming from. Sigurd notes that Desmond is on the terminal a lot as well. The next log is called Nonsense. Desmond instructs Sigurd to write down what they figured out with minimal nonsense. Sigurd does not like being told what to do, so he puts nonsense in it, basically. A new member called Lucas joins the crew and is apparently incredibly scared and confused. Desmond traces the call and they find out that the calls are actually coming from across the solar system. Sigurd believes the story the voice in the walkie told him might be true of the monster in the company building and the golden planet inside of it.
This footage was found in a chasm on the moon known as Dine. To this day, no evidence of the two individuals in the footage has been found, besides the footage itself, which has not been altered from its original version, besides small edits made for time. Two, one, action. Uh, are you recording? Yeah. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is, uh, you know, me. I, uh, you know me. And my friend, we're recording. We've been working for the company for a little bit. And we're going to a new planet today. Can you believe that? A new planet. It's very <laughs> exciting. And, yeah. It's called... Dine. This is frozen rocky. <clears throat> Unlikely for complex orbits. light. Alright, well, do you have- Uh, hold on. We need to land. Let me- Alright, we're gonna follow the lights to the facility. I think that's what we're supposed to do. It's really foggy and windy, huh? Yeah. You farted, no one would even know. Well, I don't think anyone would know because we're in these suits anyway. That's true. You're like hotboxing yourself. But not in the Ugh. fun way, right? <laughs> yeah, not, not in the fun way. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, don't oh, let here. anyone hear you say that. Alright. Okay. This is crazy. Look at- this is different. Whoa. <clears throat> so, uh... I'm a little- I'm a little taken aback, honestly. Most of the facilities we're in look like business places. This is like a house. Like a library. I feel like we need to be quiet in here. Maybe we do. Weird. There's nothing in here. We're not clean. finding anything. Okay, I'm I'm there's gotta be another door. Oh, hey! Another door! Oh wait. Uh I hear a landmine. Hey a mug! Mug! Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Bug? Something is running around. Maybe it's just a hoarding bug. Just keep oh. your ears peeled. You know, this is fucking weird. I'm I'm probably downplaying it a little bit, but I am actually incredibly nervous. Because this is very different. This is a mansion, like this is abnormal. And the the outside just looks like a regular facility. I know. Alright, hey, open vent. What does that mean? That's not good. You know, that could mean a lot of things. Oh, do you hear that? Hear yeah, something. Whoa. Alright, I'm gonna take the stairs. Whoa, there's a spider! Oh, run! Uh, I got downstairs. Ah! I found a hair dryer. Is it? I'm running! Hey, the exit's over here. Fire. Go! Go! Oh. We gotta go back in. There's more stuff. Yeah. Company won't be happy with just this. I wanna. I wanna. Okay, it's gone. All right. Hey, check this out. <laughs> right. Pretty good. I'm gonna avoid picking up the toy. Oh my god! I just almost stepped on a fucking landmine. New creature. Ah! Oh. What's this guy? That. <clears throat> Dude, it looks spider. so cool. Come on. Shit, spider. Flashlight. Spider! Hey, uh... Jack in the box guy's following me. Okay. Okay. Uh... This is not... I don't think... Should I? Should we be around here? There's a blob up too. <laughs> Oh my god! What is happening?
Captain? Self? Okay, I'm gonna get you back to the ship. It's so dark. This is fucked. I see light. This the way? I feel bad, I feel nervous. I don't think- ah! Hiding is the next entry. Sigurd dreams of the monster in the company store breaking out of the building and chasing them. He wants to go to the coordinates where the calls come from but Desmond believes they'd need to get a separate flight to do so. Sigurd seems emotional about everything. He doesn't remember how they really got there or even saying goodbye to his own father. Ominously, he says, In my dreams, the company isn't trapped in the building at all, just hiding there. He writes that he doesn't know if he'll get to go home ever. A new log has been recently discovered, titled Real Job, it's dated October 1st, 1968, which would be 14 days before the chronological final log titled Desmond. In this log, it seems that Sigurd is beginning to become a little bit upset. Desmond is prioritizing stun grenades over his snack packets, and he threatens to take a dump on the control lever if he doesn't order his things. It seems that he's also become kind of frightened from all the things that have happened throughout the story. He goes on vow and gets pale, and apparently he saw Richard on a hill, which we all know could mean that there's a mimic around. This is probably the most emotional entry because he admits to missing his father. He talks about the fact that human beings are staying on Titan and hopes that his father isn't one of them. They even mention that there's possibly going to be a war and say that it could be very different looking in just two years. Everyone else is afraid to quit, and they can barely sleep to meet Quota, as the Quota gets worse every time. Sigurd admits that he feels as if he's being squeezed through a needle. He reminisces about what it was like working with his dad and spending time with them. The last entry is simply titled Desmond. I believe it is Desmond writing this entry, or possibly Sigurd writing to Desmond. The writing style is very different from Sigurd's, so take that either way. This entry is dated October 15th, but also the 3rd. The final entry comes to the conclusion that there is a monster within the company. That the scrap being given is actually feeding it. That it is possibly a great danger to the entire system. Maybe even the desolate moons have something to do with the monster. The reason I believe it's Desmond is the outro, which is incredibly polite in comparison to Sigurd's rather sultry manner. These are all of the logs that were left. This is what most of the lore of Lethal Company is comprised of, besides the creatures that skulk around the moons themselves, the things on the TV, etc. I thought at first that the bestiary might have been written by Sigurd, but that could have also been written by Desmond or Jess as well, considering Sigurd's rather unhinged writing style, such as, They took my pickles! But of course I could be wrong, these are just my thoughts as I am also out here. I'm trying to give you this information so you don't end up like us. Like me. If you're here, you're already too far gone. Just try and survive if you can. But if you're hearing this somewhere else, remember that the company isn't what it's made out to be. I don't know what it is or who runs it. I don't know where they are. I don't know if Sigurd and his crew are still alive. What I do know is there's a drill at the company building that's waiting to be fixed. That there's a ghost girl that haunts those of us who work for the company, and she wants to play hide and seek. If she catches you, you lose, and when I say lose, I mean everything. The Thistle Nebula, at least I assume that's where we were, is basically haunted. I don't know how an entire solar system is haunted, but I guess it is. There are things I can't explain, things we can't explain. I think there's something terrible out there, whether it be at the company store or somewhere else amongst the stars. If you think that there's more to this, let me know. I'm, I'm willing to do some digging. 
but we have to meet quota, or you know what's going to happen. We do not want to get fired. Ah, comedy and tragedy. Two of the key parts of life. This world is simultaneously hilarious and terrifying to exist in. So having two physical masks to represent these ideas is fantastic, right? Especially because you can sell them. But no, no, that would be too easy. They're worth a bit of money, yes, but they have another more devious purpose. These masks are haunted. By what? Well, like so many other things in this universe, we don't know. If you pick them up, don't dare wear them. Not only would you be wearing a mask on top of a mask, which would make you look stupid and dumb, but they'll possess you. The comedy mask, from what I understand, doesn't do it immediately. So you can play around and scare people. The tragedy mask, though, bam, that shit is instant. Like gas station sushi, it will change you. You become a lifeless zombie possessed by the mask. Your only goal now is to hunt your former crewmates, and like gas station sushi, the mask will make you project bloody vomit directly into their faces. Unlike gas station sushi, however, this will cause a new mask to form on them and also possess them. I'm guessing that the vomit that the mask makes is like cherry slushy colored ectoplasm. Ectoplasm, by the way, is basically ghost goo. Look it up. These guys can also just be somewhere on the moon. Probably former crewmates from other ships. No! <laughs> Merry Christmas! Or so I'd say if it was still Christmas and what we were talking about was in any way merry. Roaming the halls of the buildings are the new guardians of the place. The bestiary reads, The guardians of the house. They watch it with one tireless eye, which only senses movement. It remembers the last creature it saw, so don't try to trick it twice. I haven't countered them many times, but others have, and the results may vary. And by vary, I mean you usually end up in various positions after being shot to death with their shotgun. But if you're lucky and skillful with a spade or sign, you can dash these villains away and snag yourself a nifty little boomstick. And, like Ash Williams, you can show the monsters of these moons just how gruely a firearm can really be. You'll know these mechanized Christmas villains by their creaky march, the occasional fondling of their shotgun, and if they see you, the fun little aggressive song that plays as they hunt you down and try to shoot you to death. I don't know if these monsters are only seasonal, which is a strange thing to say, but I mean, look at them. So, we've gone over all of the logs of Sigurd, and we've explored some of the monsters of the Lethal Company universe. What can we make of all of this that we've seen today? of all these tantalizing hauntings and mesmerizing mysteries. Right now I'm going to try to piece it all together and get an idea of what's going on, and where the future of Lethal Company's story may go. The story of Sigurd is scattered with things we ourselves experience in gameplay, as well as details that are only hinted at by the world around us. The story of people talking on the radio or the phone to Sigurd is just that, a story, but the latest log does throw a wrench into our understanding of the world of Lethal Company. It's implied that some people lived on the moons that we visit, as Sigurd hopes that his dad isn't staying on Titan. Now, of course, if you've played the game, you know that Titan is a premium moon and is completely lacking humans or whatever the player race is. This can mean a few things. One, that the story of Sigurd taking place in the 1960s means that these logs are from a long time ago and when we're playing is even further in the future are that Sigurd's family and many others are dead, and that means that there is at least some credence to the idea that the hauntings we experience were once people who lived in these places. This is given credence as Sigurd mentions some kind of war going on, which only adds to the possibility of why all these hauntings are taking place. Not to mention the fact that in the Coilhead's logs, it's theorized to have been some type of living weapon of war. Of course, this doesn't even mention the idea that the company is feeding the scrap to some giant monster within the walls of the company building, and why it's eating the scrap that we collect. My theory is that all of these places give off some type of radiation or spiritual residue that collects on the objects we find, and the monster within the walls of the company feeds less on the physical objects themselves and more on whatever is on them. Of course, there's no evidence of this besides the radiation that is given off by the apparatus, and that's not even really evidence, it's just me making a stringboard theory based on what we see within the game. Why are humans living on these moons? Well, in the log for the bunker spider, we see that something called the boat is mentioned, and though this isn't 
elaborated much on in the game, it seems to imply to me some kind of like saving arc that fled from Earth or wherever to where we are now. The reason we exist within this place is because the boat brought us here. The place that I'm talking about is the Thistle Nebula, as it is mentioned throughout the logs. That is where I think Lethal Company takes place, as you've heard me mention within this video. I'm pretty sure it says a few times Monsters of the Thistle Nebula, so I just assume we're talking about monsters that inhabit the Thistle Nebula, that's where we are. If whatever it is talking to Sigurd is right, the thing that talked to him through the phone or the radio, then the monster within the company's store ate an entire planet, but not just any planet, the Golden Planet, which is either a utopia or an actual planet made of gold that is apparently some type of legend in the universe of Lethal Company. It seems the people who lived there were at least still alive in the monster's stomach when Sigurd was around. Again, whether this was a long time ago or more recently, we don't know. So, what's with all the monsters in the Lethal Company universe then? As the logs explain, some of these creatures are just evolved aliens local to the Thistle Nebula. Beings that evolved here, though strangely and apparently quickly. This might be because of the strange and ghostly nature of the Thistle Nebula. There are so many different monsters that we can only wonder how such a conglomeration of horrifying freaks has gathered like a murderous circus housed within the concrete factories on the moons instead of under some drab tent somewhere. It could be something to do with the radiation the apparatus gives off, which does seem to draw out more monsters when you grab it. It could be that the entire nebula is haunted because of the possibly Lovecraftian thing that is housed within the walls of the company. Or it could be that these are the leftover monsters, weapons, and spirits of people who had to face some kind of space war that took many, many lives. Or it could be just for convenience to have a fun game but also be scary and have a sci-fi basis in space as well. Of course, that wouldn't fit my channel, so I want to think about the lore of it all. <laughs> and there are many places that the story could go from here with the machine under the company building, the target on the wall, and the spots for it look to be power nodes we know as the apparatuses, there very well could be an end game to Lethal Company sometime in the future that features us breaking into the company and keep the horror. We've been helping, feeding, but of course, I imagine that's going to be a good bit into the future. The game is, after all, only in early access. Entities and you. Like most jobs, yours has obstacles that you must surpass. It's not like something as silly as forgetting to file Monday's report. There are many dangers and entities out to take away your life. Today, we'll discuss a few quick points on how to avoid these entities and how they relate to you. The baboon hawk, despite their name, doesn't really look like a baboon or a hawk. These lovable guys are strange, territorial, and very bouncy. We recommend avoiding them, but they are more scared of you than you are of them. That is unless they're in a group, in which case they aren't scared of you and you should run away or stick with fellow crewmates. Or they might just kill you, and you don't want that. <laughs> That'll mean a deduction from your crew's pay. The snare flea is an interesting little guy. Think of them as like a living bear trap, but for a human's head instead of a bear's feet. These little guys like to crawl through vents and then find a nice comfortable spot on a damp ceiling. And then, if you walk beneath them, they drop down onto your head and wrap around it just like a scarf. Except instead of a scarf, they're a bug that's boring into your skull to eat your brain. You'll need to whack them off with a shovel, otherwise they will eat your brain. Haven't they heard just how high in cholesterol brain is? The Hygrodare aren't incredibly lethal, but they can kill ya. Think of them like a pool of living acid. Fine to look at, but keep your distance. Apparently they like music. I wonder if we could make them a playlist. If you get near them, they'll follow you. It's best to jump over them. If you land in them, well, we hope you have insurance. We're not providing it. The hoarding bugs. These cute little guys are a lot like you. Except they don't work for the company, they just work for their instincts. They keep territory in the many abandoned facilities and like to have a hoard of items there. They might want something you have, so you can choose to give it up, fight, or run. 
They aren't the most dangerous. In fact, we find them a little cuddly. But just be careful, because they do have a temper, and yes, they can kill. The moons of the Thistle Nebula are mysterious, each different, but in one way they are the same. They house the facilities. These facilities are where we go to collect scrap, but why? Where did these buildings come from? And why do they seem to go on unnaturally, stretching past the limitations of their housing to spaces they should not be? It's hard to tell the purpose of these buildings. While some areas seem to be storage or even factory space, there isn't enough identifiable anything to generate an idea of what these buildings used to be used for. Yes, we use them now for scrapping, but they had to have a purpose before that, right? Not to mention that the designs of the buildings don't facilitate what we'd think of as an efficient workflow, with long, twisting, nonsensical hallways, pits that lead to death and seem to serve absolutely no purpose besides that, and just complete dead ends, rooms that mean nothing, that lead to nowhere, full of junk. Yes, they're powered by these apparatuses, but why power these buildings? Maybe these apparatuses have been left, but what were they being used for anyway when they were being powered and people were here, if they were? We know from the latest log discovered that people at some point lived on Titan. Did they live in these facilities? Again, this wouldn't make sense. Hell, even in the mansions, on the paid moons, we never really find bedrooms. We find endless bookshelves in the occasional kitchen with just a, a lot of lamps for some reason. And the random assortment of objects don't make sense either. A rubber ducky, a basket of bottles, engines, paintings, just stuff everywhere. Some of it does make sense and then others don't. So, what we've got so far is that the buildings don't make sense. Like, it's really hard to tell what they used to be used for. Even the manors, because they don't seem like they're actually used as homes, but more facades of homes. Like I said, you can never find a bedroom, you can never find a bed, you can never find a bathroom. Oh, and I did mention this at the start, but I will try to elaborate on it more now. These buildings don't make sense spatially. Some people like to call this non-Euclidean geometry, but basically it's the idea that, oh, this hallway goes back behind where the entrance is, but that doesn't make sense because that means I should be outside. It's not possible. So basically, you go in the building and it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, which, you know, it's not Doctor Who, it shouldn't do that. So what does this all mean? It's my theory that the buildings we enter are more like portals. Now, do I have anything to back that up? No, besides the evidence of what we experience. We're really going someplace else when we enter into them. A vast network of hallways and rooms that are really one place, but can be accessed by many different doors. Possibly a different dimension of some sort, and all of the facilities just lead to it. It's difficult to say, because it just doesn't make sense any other way. Besides the fact that maybe this is all a video game and we're not real, but whatever. What about the objects that we pick up to collect money? Well, my crackpot theory is that maybe they were people once? transformed into objects? That's just one theory, I have a few others. Like earlier in this video, I mentioned the idea that maybe they have radiation or some type of spiritual energy on them, like ectoplasm. And it's possible that the monetary values that the items have and why one item can be more expensive or less than another is because they have more of that energy or something like that. The truth is, we don't know what any of this means. We're just throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. And we just keep going anyway. One building after another. One more hallway, and another hallway, and another hallway, and another room, and another factory floor, and another hallway, and another hallway. Sorry about that. Forest Keepers, these lovable guys are gigantic, probably seven times bigger than the average crewmate. These guys mean well, but are just a little too curious for their own good. If they grab you, they will stick you into their mouth and bite down. They only mean to see what it feels like to have you in their mouth, but their curiosity is deadly to the average crewmate. A curious forest keeper has been known to cause severe lacerations, which nearly always result in death. Avoid if you can. Earth Leviathan 
Not much is known about these wormy guys, besides the fact that they love to stay underground. If you hear one, you best try retracing your steps. Or run. <laughs> we'll admit we don't really know what's best. But in a life or death situation, you do what you can. Oh, bunker spiders. We don't like these. Not much needs to be said. These big guys are dangerous and should be avoided. Do not step into their webs. If you have a shovel, try squishing them. Note, it may take multiple whacks to squish them. You best believe we weren't going to skip talking about circuit bees. These creatures are easily avoidable. They'll usually stick to their hive and only attack if you go near it. The hives are worth a pretty penny though, so you may find it worth your time and skin to risk it. But be warned, once taken, these bees don't muck about. Spore lizards, though not often encountered, are more of a nuisance than anything. In fact, you might even find yourself endeared to them. Once encountered, they defensively shoot out a purple gas that does nothing more than block out one's vision. Besides this, they are mostly harmless. What you do when encountering them is up to you. Note, the company does not condone pets aboard the capsule ship. Thank you for watching the entities and you. We hope you've learned something swell today. A cube is a great item to turn in. Who doesn't love a toy robot? A giant axle? We could use a few of those. Paintings? How tasteful! A magnifying glass? Elementary, dear crewmate! <laughs> Alright! And that concludes today's presentation. We hope you've enjoyed the program. The company is a great place to work thanks to people like you. And now that you've watched your mandatory introduction video, get back out there and meet the quota. Or else... <laughs> Oh, you better do it! Here's some quick scrapping tips that you might not know. Did you know that you can actually whisper without alerting the dogs? Now, you do have to actually whisper and mind your volume, but it does work. If you get the apparatus, it's probably best to leave the facility. That warning about radiation is a draw to monsters. Really, it just raises the chance of having some more monsters spawn in the facility, there are two masks that can possess you, the tragedy and the comedy mask. If you put the tragedy mask on, it will immediately possess you. If you put the comedy mask on, there is a much lower chance. It can still possess you, but it takes longer and it won't happen immediately. That's why it's comedy, so you can put it on and mess with your teammates. It's, it's all in good fun until you get blood vomited in your face. The gift box is almost always just better to open and get the item inside because more often than not, it will be worth more than the gift box itself. Anyway, that's some random tips to improve your Lethal Company game. We've got one more stop before we end this video. Why is Lethal Company a great game? Well first, because it's a comedy horror game. There are a lot of comedy horror movies, but comedy horror in games is rare. They're becoming more popular in recent years thanks to the continuously fantastic indie scene, specifically on sites like itch.io and Steam. Look at games like Squirrel Stapler or Night at the Gates of Hell, or even Zeker's other game before Lethal Company, The Upturned. Now, of course, there are a lot of horror games with comedic aspects. Think about Resident Evil or even Silent Hill. Both of those have parts in it that are obviously meant to be kind of funny or silly, but I'm talking about games that have a equal parts horror and equal parts comedy mixture, and I think Lethal Company is definitely one of those. From the outset, Lethal Company doesn't take itself overly seriously. The goofy character designs, the silly but amazingly catchy tune that introduces you when you first load into the game, the running animation, I mean, look at this. This legit made me giggle the first time we played and it was only like 10 minutes in, and just from my character running around. I want to start off by talking about how important and fantastic the sound design in this game is. The sound effects in Lethal Company are incredibly punchy, but they aren't overly loud. They're just very noticeable. Defined thunks and clunks, such as the hiss and the ka-chunk of the door opening of the ship, or the ding of a day pass during the quota period. Not to mention that almost every single item has a unique sound used to represent picking it up or setting it down. And I find these, these item pickups and drop sounds strangely calming. 
Sometimes when I go to sleep, I'll literally listen to people playing Lethal Company and the sound of them picking up and dropping items is actually relaxing to me. And to me, it's a big deal that something so subtle is there in this game because yes, the sounds are noticeable and calming, but that sets them against everything else. The silly movements and bright sounds of the game are set at ends with the other half of the game. Continuing the theme of sound design, when you step out onto one of the moons when you first arrive, it gets eerily quiet right after the ship doors open. Maybe there's just the wind, and then occasionally an ambient piano track will kick in. I don't know how to perfectly describe these tracks that play, but I'll do my best. They kind of remind me of Minecraft's ambient music, but they're somehow more unsettling. Like, they are calming and relaxing and nice to listen to, but they have a dissonant tone to them in a way. The melody is nice, but the sound of them is just off enough that it makes you uneasy. You'll see birds, the manticoils flying around, hear them flap off, and the buzzing of the locusts nearby, and not to mention the loud word that the facilities give off themselves, indicating that something is going on inside. And then you make your way into the door. The sound of the door is loud, creaky, and pronounced, and you know when you're inside. It gets deathly still, the new ambience being the distant whir of machines, as well as your footsteps on the metal grating below or even the concrete. Unless, of course, there's a turret that spawns in the first room, in which case there's the loud sound of gunfire, and suddenly not only are you shocked, but you're dead. Jacob? I have a bad feeling that he did not. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man. Fuck. If you aren't immediately killed upon entering a facility, this is when the real gameplay loop of the game begins. You start by walking around these desolate buildings on these abandoned moons, looking for random junk. A magnifying glass, or a puzzle cube, a rubber ducky, or a car engine for some reason a basket of bottles, etc, etc. All of them make noise when you pick them up, as I mentioned earlier. Some make even more noise, like the toy robot, which for some reason sounds like clanking machinery, but also the distant laughter of children. Or the clacking teeth, which, like an old-fashioned toy, continue to clack away in your pocket, cartoonishly. While collecting junk, we begin to hear more things. The hiss of steam, the scary cry of a baby for some reason, the random creak of metal as we walk around the facility, or any number of the entities that scuttle around and hunt us down. This is the real wrench in the game's gameplay loop. The entities. Some of them are just straight up monsters, alien beings that inhabit these moons, like the Hoarding Bug, my personal favorite. These little guys scuttle around and steal your loot, or, well, steal loot that would be yours but is now theirs. They aren't aggressive unless you take things in front of them, typically, because sometimes they will just randomly get angry. Here's an example of one that was just an asshole for basically no reason. But they're cute and they're silly, I kind of dig them. They do this little arm thing where if you look at them, they like raise their arms at you, I think that's pretty funny. And now that I've told you about the hoarding bug, I can tell you that there are a bunch of other entities that will give you problems that aren't even as nice as they are. Like the coil head, which is only supposed to move when you aren't looking at it, and very quickly replaces your head with a spring if you look away for too long. The coil head's sound design is fantastic, by the way. You can hear their footsteps, like, trudging around, and they will stop when you look at them and their head will spring forward, making this loud, sprawling sound that kind of informs you to just how close you were to death before catching them. And also, the sound it makes when they get you is almost like your head being popped off by the spring, and your head just oh, flies off. Or the Bracken, who's kind of a variation of that game. You want to look at him, but not for too long. You just want to take a peek. If you look for too long, he gets angry and then runs after you and will kill you. And if you don't look for too long, he will sneak up behind you and kill you. He will literally just come up and break your neck. The way that you know the Bracken has been seen and is going to run away is he will bristle, his parts of his body will move, and you'll also hear this 
bristling sound and like a hiss and a low roar sound. So you know, hey, I saw him and he's going to go away. And if you don't look at him long enough, well, you'll hear another great piece of sound design, which is your neck being broken by. His movement is incredibly loud and sounds like nothing else in the game. So if you hear them, you best get going. And so I think I've made my point. Sound design is really important in this game, but every one of these entities has a different way of interacting with not only their environment, but also you as the player. And when you mix them all together, you get this big bowl of horror gaming anxiety, but also all of these different possibilities of things that can happen that can cause humorous moments. And the more people that you add to that bowl adds to more of the tension and hilarity. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the traps that you have to look out for, like the mines and the steam that can block your vision. There was a switch over here. Or the gaps that you can accidentally fall into. Oh, and not only are there monsters in the facilities waiting for you, but there are ones outside that appear as well, like the tree giant or the eyeless dogs. No! All right, bye everyone. Oh, I got David. Or the little girl that can go inside or outside. Uh oh, uh oh. Uh oh, uh oh. Uh oh, uh oh. Oh my god, I see it. I see it. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Or the mask that can go inside or outside. Do you have one? Can't. Oh my god! It's the way all of these different systems interact with each other. The different traps, the monsters, the randomly generated pathing of the facilities as well as your need to get loot or you lose the game. So imagine you're minding your business with an armful of loot, looking at a coil head, when a bracken comes up behind you and breaks your neck. The possibilities in this game are endless and as Zeekers adds to them they're only going to grow. Not to mention the little things like the bridge collapsing that you can have happen or the fact that you can whisper and the eyeless dogs won't detect you, or the fact that there is a secret insanity system at play that only affects the ambient noise and the little girl's chance of haunting you. It's these little things like this that the average player probably won't notice that make this game great and show Zeeker's prowess as a developer. These little things add up. The fact that there are really valuable collectibles like gold bars, or how the little ghost girl works, or that the shotgun from the nutcrackers can actually be taken from them when they are killed and can be used to kill other enemies. And it's these intricate little details that show how much care was put into this game, but also the want for the players to just have fun. When I found out that you could actually whisper and not be heard by the dogs, I was like in shock for a moment. I thought that was so fucking cool, and I still do. So. Why is Lethal Company a great game? Why is it a great comedy horror game? It takes itself seriously enough to be a good game and have scary moments, but not too seriously that it doesn't want to have fun with itself and you. I can exemplify this just by saying that you can mask up with those masks, become possessed, and fuck over your teammates, or have your neck broken while going around with the air horn that plays the Alexis Texas moan. Don't look that up. The horror in this game is paid attention to. The atmosphere is great, it's dark, it's scary, there are these fantastic creepy ambient tracks and noises, and the monsters are also well designed. But there's also the silly air horn and the boombox that plays these funky tracks. And you can kill your teammates by dropping a ladder on them, or get mad at a loot bug for being a dickhead and it raises its arms at you like, come on! There's a serious threat that you have to deal with, and a goal that you have to accomplish. The proximity voice chat in Lethal Company is absolutely fantastic. That's another part of the sound design that is just nailed. The distance of the voice and the fading that happens is perfect. The echoes, it's perfect for scares, it's perfect for comedy. Seekers has done a phenomenal job and I want more proximity voice chat in horror games that is just like this. So to wrap it all up, Lethal Company is a simple game. You go and collect loot. But the complications that are added on top of it can be complex. The horror is there in these situations, but so is the comedy. 
Lethal Company is just a great game all around because of that. At its core, it's simple, but it blooms from that simplicity. But as I've said when talking about games, I'm not a game designer or a programmer, so I just tried to discuss what I can tangibly experience as a player, and I hope I was able to explain that well to you. Lethal Company is a fantastic game. It is worth the money that you will spend on it. If you have friends to play it with, or even just randoms, I bet you'll have a great time. So, that's it. That's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something, or just had fun watching it, even if you just had it on the background while you were making lunch or washing dishes. Anyway, I'm Ghost on Holiday, and remember... It wants my pickles! Hey everyone, I really hope you enjoyed the video. I wanted to experiment and try doing a bit of lore and game discussion in a video while writing some of my own little skits and segments, and felt Lethal Company was a great game or thing to test that out with. I really enjoy Lethal Company, I think it's a fantastic game and the developer, Zekers, has done a great job creating it. All the enemy designs are awesome and the way they work in the game has a really simple but satisfying core gameplay loop with so much fantastic design built around it. I want to thank my friends Daniel and Flipsy for helping me by filming their gameplay, as well as my brother, his partner, and a host of other friends who played along with me. I also used footage from streamer Charborg and some random clips from other various sources. This video took quite a long time to make, so if you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to let me know if you want more like it. I am also planning, if I hit 10,000 subscribers in the near future, to possibly open a Patreon to help me try to transition into doing YouTube full-time. I look forward to future updates on Lethal Company as well as my future here on YouTube, and I'm just really excited to keep doing videos, especially ones like this, and I hope you guys like it. Anyway, I'm Ghosts on Holiday, and remember... It wants my pickles!